this morning. Outrageous courageousness. You know, it's easy to talk about courage when things are going well. And it's easy to say, well, in that kind of a situation, I'm at peace with my life and I know I'll handle it well. And then life hits you between the eyes. And you may not, again, Scripture says, let he that stands take heed lest he fall. Again, sometimes we're not as, as prepared as, as we think, especially if something hits us on the blind side. <clears throat> but, but when life happens, uh, we're, in, we're assaulted on every side, or someone we love dearly is, then sometimes it's a challenge to be courageous, as we would like to think. <clears throat> and all of us have had to deal with situations, so we understand that. We might even, as I've mentioned in my case, struggle with fear that we didn't realize we would be challenged with and had to be reminded and thankfully was reminded that it was a human emotion and we don't let it control us. We deal with it. And I'm going to talk about that in this lesson as well. So in this lesson, we're going to look at the relationship between courage and hope. And our emphasis is going to be how they help us on our journey to hope, how courage and hope help us, that relationship. So let's uh, let's talk about a few words here. Courage, very basically, the definition is mental or moral strength to venture, to persevere, to withstand danger and fear or difficulty. That's the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. So it's that mental or moral strength uh, to, to move beyond. It's not the absence of fear, and we know that. We, we've heard that expression, uh, <clears throat> courage is not the absence of fear. Uh, actually, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, in one of his fireside chats, remember he said, we have nothing to fear but fear itself, but there was another statement attributed to him that, lends, that, that was the basis of the idea that uh, it's not the absence of fear. He said, courage is not the absence of fear, but rather the assessment that something else is more important than fear. And so it's not the absence of fear, it's the realization, wait a minute, there's something else, I have got to move up. <laughs> it, it, it's it's the, the idea. There's something else out there that I've got to deal with that's greater and more important than my personal fears. And, and so you deal with it. Fear doesn't necessarily go away, but you learn to move beyond it and handle it. Outrageous is a great word. Bold and unusual. And <laughs> I thought, well, you know, I'll, I'll come up with a couple of examples from Scripture. Man, Scripture is just packed full of outrageous courageousness. The idea of outrageous is bold and unusual. And so when we put them together, the idea of courage and outrageous, we come up with it's the kind of courage that helps us to not give up. It's the courage to seek a way through. What makes it outrageous at least in the world's perspective, is that so many times in a case of fear or dealing with a life issue, someone would say, well, just give in. Just, just deal with it. Or, or just, just give up. And yet, we don't. We move beyond that. That's, to the world, an outrageous part. And so as I looked through Scripture and was thinking, well, who would be a great example of that? I, I thought about Joshua. Man, you know one of the hardest, Brent, I, I, I was reading in, in one of my textual, textbook readings that I had to do in my degree, it, it was talking about one of the hardest jobs is to be a preacher that follows a, another preacher. Somebody who's been a very popular preacher for a congregation and they retire or move on or whatever, and then you got to step in. That's a tough job. And I thought about a college football coach. I, I, I don't want to be the guy to replace Nick Saban. I don't care how much money you pay me. You're, you, it's going to be hard for you to 
live to that level of performance that uh, he had. And so here's Joshua. He's the guy that's got to follow Moses. That's a tough job. What was said actually six times in the book of Joshua, even said by the people that Joshua was leading. Remember? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. We even sing that song. So be strong and courageous. Even the people told him that. And, and, and they had to tell him that because he was challenged. He had to overcome fear, self-doubt. Can I really do this? Now, he had already proven himself in the battle with the Amalekites and, and then as a spy going into uh, Canaan and coming back out. Remember there were 12 spies that went into Canaan? What did 10 of them say? There's some big, ugly dudes over there. We have lost this to start with. But what did Joshua and Caleb say? Wait a minute. God's on our side. Obviously paraphrasing. But that was what they were communicating. That was outrageous courageousness. The others said, give up. They said, no. We got this. God's got it. What's another character that comes to mind that would be outrageous courageousness? God's got this. I heard David. David. Yeah. David. What did he say? The battle belongs to the Lord. He was mad. What are you, what are you letting this guy say these things about our God? And I, I like the part in the narrative about that where David runs to Goliath. The Lord's got this. And he did. So there's so many other examples. That's Old Testament. And I think about the apostles. In In the New Testament, those guys, outrageous courageousness. Had to grow to it. Didn't have it all the time. In fact, when our Lord was arrested, they all took off. We think not so, but they they all took off. They scattered. John and Peter found their way back, but they were all huddled in fear. But they had to grow beyond that, and they did when they realized God's got this. I think, and we talked about a couple of weeks ago, I mentioned about the first century century Christians, what they dealt with, and, and yet when they were persecuted, they took the word of God with them outrageous courageousness. Um, Hebrews 11 is packed full. I talked about uh, in in the uh, unsung heroes class that I did first century church, uh, starting in uh, Hebrews 11 around verse 35. uh, You you read through that narrative and how so many people uh, gave their lives and their livelihoods and all that they had about themselves and their families. And uh, didn't see the immediate result from that in their lifetime so many times. And then it goes on to say, we're not worthy of them. That kind of outrageous courageousness. I don't know that I could stand in an arena and have a roaring lion coming at me to destroy me and kill me or my loved ones. I don't know that. And so... That was outrageous courageousness. We have these examples throughout Scripture. Just, and you have so many that are your favorites as well. They're all great examples. They are there to teach us, are they not? They show God's faithfulness, but they also are there to show us examples of courage. Outrageous courageousness. So this morning, as I was going over my notes, I I came back into the living room. I told Lynn, I got to write this down before I forget it. Put a thing in my note. Outrageous courageousness. It's not, it is not from desperation. Sometimes we think it is, but it truly, the outrageous courageousness that we learn as children of God is not from desperation. It's from a growing faith. It's from a growing realization that God is faithful. And so when we're faced with those seemingly desperate situations, we look beyond them. 
I love the song, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. And that, that's, that's the way we look at it. One of the other things that takes outrageous courageousness is something every one of us can do and are supposed to do. And that's to present the gospel to the world. That, in so many cases, unfortunately does take outrageous courageousness. It's easy to sit in the auditorium on Sunday and sing praises to the Lord. Great. We need to do that. Absolutely. We got to go beyond that because our role is, remember what I said, the first introduction. We are in the hope business. That's what we do is we demonstrate hope to the world and we teach about hope to the world so they too can find that hope and grow in it. And that takes outrageous courageousness because a lot of times it's just easy to sit quietly and let it move on. The opportunity passes us by. Don't, and I'm challenging myself on this. Don't do that. Seize the moment. God brought the seeker to the teacher. That's how it happens. And so we have to be ready. That's what Scripture teaches us. All right. Enough preaching about that. Let's move on. Uh, sometimes when we're, uh, we're facing something, it's not actually the f- thing that we're facing that causes us fear. That may be the vehicle. That may be the environment. But there's something else in, in situations. A lot of times that's behind it. Uh, sometimes a student will ask me a question, and I'll say, what's the question behind the question? There's something else. That first question was just the lead-in. There's something else behind that. And what is it that they're really trying to get at? And so sometimes our current situation is only a part of the issue. There may be something else that's causing our fear, the true cause of it. And that's what we want to try to get to because when we can get to that, then we can deal with it. And so that's where I'd like to go. <clears throat> it, 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 um, it, it's important to do a self-analysis. If we're in a situation where we feel fear about something going on, what's going on? What, what, what's, what's behind it? And so there are some questions we can ask. And again, uh, uh, these are just some general questions, some ways to help us start analyzing a situation. Uh, how does what I'm facing make me feel? And why? What, uh, what is it about this situation that creates fear in me and why? That's one question. What is it that's triggering my fear? Is it, is it fear of death? Is it fear of not being prepared uh, spiritually? Is it fear of embarrassment? Is it, is it f- fear of whatever? That, that something triggers that fear. Is it the sudden nature of something? Is it the change of something? Is it the hitting me with something totally unexpected and ill-prepared? The, those are the things. And, and, and so we begin to think about, it's, it's not fear, but there's something behind that fear. That's what we're trying to get at. What's my greatest fear about this situation? What, what, is, what is it that's just, you, you, you know, it, well, I'm, I'm afraid of this and this and this. Well, which one is your greatest fear? Maybe we can tackle that one and deal with it. And then the rest of them will go away. What do I really want to happen? And then what's holding me back? I'm in a situation, I'm feeling that fear. What is it I'd like to happen? I'd like that fear to go away. Well, what would make it go away? Or what can I do to make it go away? In other words, what's holding me back? Is it my doubt? Is it my lack of knowledge? Is it, is it again, not being prepared? And so can I do something to be prepared? So again, these are just some questions. And then that last one, <clears throat> it really helps to discuss fear with someone. I mentioned that when I was in the hospital and I'm, I'm not knowing from one day to the next what's going to happen here. Uh, 
and I, I, I'm telling you folks, if, you, if, if you've been given a diagnosis of cancer, that's bad enough. But when it's pretty serious, when the guy says, you've got about three or four weeks to live, if we don't start treatment, that'll get your attention real quick. And so it's like, man. And then you start seeing some of the symptoms. I mentioned my tone turning black. That scares you. It's not normal. And so I asked Brent. I talked to my charge nurse about it. You know, how, how do you, I'm a man of faith. Why, why am I having doubts and fears? And, and again, you, you deal with it. So it helps to talk to people about these. Someone you trust. Someone who you know can give you some insights into things. And it helps you put things in perspective and helps answer these kinds of questions. All right, so many of these, uh, again, are just helpful to talk to people about. And I'm, I'm telling you this because, I, I, again, I understand you know a lot of this, but there's people we know that don't know this, that are going to call upon us. They're going to see the difference in our life. So many people say, well, I share the gospel because I live a pure life. Well, first of all, we don't. But yes, we probably, if we're trying to be faithful to the gospel, <clears throat> faithful to our Lord, <clears throat> excuse me, we do try to live a pure life and people will see the difference. And so they'll come to us. People are going to see, okay, you're a little bit different. And, and so I want to ask you a question about something. And there's a question behind the question. I, I have a spiritual question and I have that spiritual question because I'm concerned about my level of spirituality. You see, there's a question behind the question so many times. All right, I'm off track. Let me move on. <laughs> but uh, sometimes the one we're discussing with, again, will help us narrow down what's causing our fear, what's causing our concern, and help us move beyond that. I want to talk now about the relationship between hope and courage. We understand hope. We understand courage. And now I want to look at how they work together. And they do work together. Remember the basic definition of hope, a desire accompanied by expectation or a belief of fulfillment. And so uh, these two work together, hope and courage, to give us strength when we face some sort of a deep valley in life. And we will face a deep valley in life. I have a class that I teach about dealing with life's valleys. And one of the things in my study and research, uh, somebody made a point one time that the most fertile soil happens to be in a valley, not up on the mountaintop. So sometimes it's okay to be in a valley. If you look around and say, how can I use this to the glory of God, my father? And, and so that's one way we deal with a life. That's outrageous, by the way, isn't it? Instead of being in a valley saying, oh, woe is me. Well, when you're in a valley, you're there. Deal with it. Figure out why you're in that valley and what can I do to get out of that valley. And, and, or if I'm in this valley, how can I use this to the glory of God? And you'll find yourself moving out of that valley pretty quick. At least attitudinally and spiritually. So hope and courage work together. They, they help us face those raging storms and deep valleys that we might find ourselves in. They fuel our determination to move on. Because again, if I don't have hope, it doesn't matter if I'm a brave person or not. If I have no hope, then I typically don't care and I'm going to give up and go somewhere else or do something else. So they bring us back on track to living a faithful life and providing us with a sense of purpose. I highlighted the concept of purpose because purpose is so uh, incredibly important. It's a reason to, and then you fill in the blank. You got to have purpose. Though. And so a sense of purpose is so important in life in general. Our bottom line is purpose. Ecclesiastes twelve thirteen. You know this one. Yes. The whole duty of man is to fear God and keep his commandments. I read that and I, I'm sorry. I don't mean to go against scripture. But I, I, when I read that, I think, yeah. But there's a whole lot more to that. That's a baseline. Fear God and keep his commandments. What did Jesus say about keeping commandments? If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So there's a tie in there. What are the two most important commandments? Fear God with all your heart, soul, and mind. 
and, I mean, love God, excuse me. <laughs> Thank you, Lynn. Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You see how they tie in? If, if, we, if we fear God and keep his commandments, as the writer of Ecclesiastes says, keeping God's commandment is demonstrated is a way of demonstrating our love for our Lord. And when asked about what are the two most important commandments, what am I going to be judged on? I'm going to be judged on how much I love God, which means keep his commandments and love my neighbor as myself, which is one of the commandments. So they work together. Purpose. I have a purpose. And there is no greater way to express our love for someone than to teach them the gospel and to help them. It just, that's how it works. It's just amazing. Um, When we turn to our Lord, we find hope. We truly turn to our Lord. And so that's what we do with folks. We help them turn to the Lord. I want to move on because I'm going to run out of time. Probably not, but I will. Our hope seems senseless or foolish to the world. That's the outrageous part that we have hope. The world encourages giving up. We say, nah, we're going to keep moving. We're going to find a solution. We're going to rely on our Lord. We're going to turn loose of that fear. I I, I don't have time in this lesson to talk about some specific things about that, but there are ways to do that. But sometimes it takes outrageous courageousness to sustain that hope. And, and somebody says, well, I'm nearing the end of my life. I don't have time to do all these things that might encourage hope. You, then you need to shift your focus onto what can give you hope. And, of course, eternal hope being our Lord. So we learn to deal with challenges. One challenge is to accept that there is hope. And, and again, if somebody is suffering from a catastrophic injury or disease or whatever, and they look at their life and say, yeah, I just have no hope. Yes, you do. Yes, you do have hope. If you're breathing, you have hope. And again, it may not be in the form that you think it is. And that's where we can help somebody identify where there is hope. Moving forward with courage. We talked about I know so and I'm sure of. that. That's the mature Christian's view. That's the view we grow into. And so uh, uh, we grow spiritually. We develop confidence in God's promise to be with us. And it strengthens us and delivers us. And that's a critical point. We grow to that. And if we don't feel that, then we need to work on growing toward that even more so. Even if we do feel it, we continue to grow. All right, I'm moving on. I, I got a couple of critical scriptures I want to talk about. Romans eight thirty one. Paul states, What then shall we say of these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Again, that's a realization we have to grow towards. God's with us. What what can be greater than God? Nothing. And so in the context of the verse, Paul's discussing how we deal with current situations, uh, the suffering uh, compared to the eternal glory that God has promised, and God is always faithful to his promises. Uh, He discusses hope throughout Romans, but in this chapter, he, he really gets into it. Uh, Verse 25, uh, we're to wait for God's deliverance with patience. Paul also encourages us, he reminds us that God's Spirit is with us in our times of weakness. Uh, Even to interceding for us when we cannot express our words in prayer. And then he concludes in Romans uh, Romans 8, 37 and 38, uh, that nothing is going to separate us from God's love. Nothing in all of creation can separate us from God's love. That's a wonderfully hope-filled chapter. But there's more. Romans 13, 5, Paul says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. We don't need just a little bit of hope. God gives us an abundance of hope that we may abound in hope. And the closer we draw to our Lord, the greater our hope. It's there, and we grow in it. Remember that diagram I showed? Our Lord's the constant. We grow to our Lord. And the closer we draw to our Lord, the greater our hope. All right, let me wrap up a couple of things and one more verse. 
Outrageous courageousness. It involves looking at life situations in a way that's different from the world and moving on. When the world says, give up, you're done, think about Job. I didn't mention Job because I'm going to use him in another lesson. But anyway, uh, it, it, it is uh, dealing with life situations when things are moving in, uh, in a way we didn't think they would. It's understanding what causes our fears and working to overcome them. Our Lord is going to be there to help us with it. And we can be there to help people with it. The world tells us to give up, but we don't. We move forward. We face the challenge and move forward. That's the outrageous courageousness part of it. They work together. Hope and courage gives us confidence in God's promise no matter life circumstances. We know God's promise and we move into that. All right, let me hit that last scripture. In Romans 8, 18 and 19, Paul says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing the revealing of the sons of God. God's there, and he promises salvation for us. We remain faithful. And even when we slip in our faith, it's not God that's moved away. He's there, and he's waiting and encouraging us to come back, and that's part of our role to help in that situation. All right, next week we're going to talk about things that rob us of hope. What robs us of a hope, and how can we combat that? Thank you very much.